Hello and welcome to the, uh, the first in a series of four films about higher level atomic structure. Hopefully you've seen the films about standard level atomic structure um, because there's quite a lot of overlap between the two topics as you might expect I suppose. Um, this one, this particular film deals with successive ionization energies and hopefully by the end of this film you'll know what we mean by a successive ionization energies and uh, you'll be able to write equations to show the processes that are involved here and also you'll be able to uh, understand how we can determine information about an atom's electron configuration by looking at its successive ionization energies. Okay, now first of all let's look at some really important definitions. Um, these are phrased in lots of different ways depending on where you look at them um, but it's important to know that the first ionization energy of an atom is the amount of energy required to turn one mole of gaseous atoms into one mole of gaseous one plus ions. This is quite often given as the enthalpy change when uh, one mole of electrons is removed from one mole of gaseous atoms uh, turning them into one mole of gaseous one plus ions but if you think about it I suppose if you've got one mole of gaseous atoms and you turn them into one mole of gaseous one plus ions then you must have removed one mole of electrons but anyway there's a number of different ways of defining these things I suppose one of the really important things about this definition is that we're talking about a molar quantity so we're talking about one mole of something the atoms have to be gaseous and the reason for that is because um, you're ionizing them in a very similar way to what we saw in a mass spectrometer you're bombarding them with electrons and if they're a great big lump of solid it's quite hard to get at them with your electron gun um, and again uh, the ions that we form are gaseous okay so how you express the fact that each atom is losing one electron is kind of up to you to an extent but make sure you realize that it's a molar quantity and we're dealing with gaseous particles similarly the second ionization energy is the amount of energy required to turn one mole of gaseous one plus ions into one mole of gaseous two plus ions so in other words this is removing the first electron and this is talking about removing the second electron from atoms okay but not just from one atom but from one mole okay and on and on and on now if we realize what the definitions are then we should be able to write equations however it's quite easy to mess it up if you don't know your definitions very well for example if I was asked to write the, an equation for the first ionization of sodium I might write something like well sodium turns into sodium plus and gives up an electron. Now that's good because we're removing an electron from a sodium atom. However, what we haven't made clear in our equation is the fact that we know that we're starting with a gas and we're ending up with a gas. Okay, if you're asked to write the third ionization energy for, I don't know, phosphorus, then you need to realize that you're starting with a two plus ion because you've already removed two electrons. It's a gaseous ion and you're turning it into a 3 plus ion because you're removing the third electron okay so the equations are quite simple we're taking something and we're removing an electron from it to turn it into something more positive but do remember the state symbols because they show that you know the definitions now if we look at the successive ionization energies of any particular atom and bear in mind um, that around around about the same time that people were looking at line spectra and trying to determine something from them we were also getting information about ionization energies and our kind of our view of the atom was gradually evolving and I imagine it must have been <laughs> really quite an incredible time to be around if you were in this field because you're seeing all this different evidence coming together so imagine I suppose that you were the person who managed to remove all these different electrons from a potassium atom okay and measured the amount of energy that was required so in other words we're measuring how much energy we have to bombard well, what energy our electrons in our electron gun have to be to remove these electrons okay so it's taking some energy to remove one it's taking quite a lot more energy to remove two and 
If you think about it, it doesn't really matter what your particle is, let me call it x, you'd expect it to be harder to remove the second electron from x than it is to remove the first because, well, the first electron is coming from a neutral atom, the second electron is coming from something that's already positive. So there's going to be a stronger attraction between something that's positive and a negative particle than between something that is neutral and a negative particle. So we'd expect to see a gradual rise in the ionization energies of any atom that we chose, and in fact this is the case. However, what's a bit more interesting about these successive ionization energies of potassium, for example, is not only do we get a gradual rise, we get these sudden jumps. Okay. Now, again, imagine you're one of the scientists who's just kind of um, been doing experiments on atoms and looking at line spectra and seeing the research that others had done on it, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, if electrons are in shells and if they've got different energies, then this stuff really makes sense, you know? I mean, I've got one electron in one shell, and then suddenly I'm removing a bunch of electrons that are in a shell that's much closer to the nucleus. So they're much, much harder to remove. And then when I get to the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I've removed eight from that next shell in, I get another jump. So maybe there's another shell of electrons, and maybe that shell can only hold eight electrons. And how many, sh how many electrons can this shell hold? Well, one, two, three, another eight. And then I can only remove two electrons from, the, from potassium before I run out of electrons to remove. So surely this is telling me that Perhaps there's two electrons in my first shell, there's eight in the next, there's eight in the next, and there's one in the last. And not only now do we have some ideas about the fact that electrons are in shells and that those shells have different energies, we're also starting to get evidence for how many electrons can actually fit into those shells. Which, I mean, for someone studying something that you can't even see, must be really quite... An, an incredible um, discovery to be making. Anyway, if you were in an exam and you weren't in this kind of uh, this this state of kind of major excitement at the discoveries you're making, but you're actually looking at an exam question and you're trying to make something of the numbers, it's unusual that you'll be given a graph like this. You'll normally be given tables of data with numbers in, and unfortunately they won't be colour coded like this one. But if we look at magnesium we can see that there's a gradual rise in the ionization energies before there's a great big jump and then gradual rises. If we look at silicon, there's four gradual rises before there's a great big jump. If someone just gave me these numbers for silicon and said to me, what group do you think it's in? What group do you think silicon is in? Well, I could go, well, I reckon there must be four electrons in the outer shell because I can remove four electrons before I move into the next shell. So that's suggests that silicon must be in group 4. Well, we know that silicon is in group 4, but if I was given some mystery data, I could decide what group an element was in. Okay, so we can get a lot of information from successive ionization energies and make sure that you can spot the big jumps, basically, in exam questions and decide how many electrons there are in the particular shells. Okay, let's just look back at what we were hoping to achieve by the end of this film. Hopefully we know now what is meant by a six or by not by a successive ionization NG because you can't really have one in isolation, but by successive ionization NGs. And you can write an equation for a first or a second or a third or whatever number ionization NG. And what's more, you can look at uh, tables of data with successive ionization NGs in and use that information to tell you about the electron configuration of an atom, or in other words, where its electrons are in which shells, and how many electrons there are in the shells. Okay, um, hopefully that all makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, or if you've got any other questions or comments that you'd like to, uh, to put to me, then feel free to comment on YouTube, or to come and see me um, when you get some time.